so we've got the hub handy and a little bit of history too. And uh, so first of all, I'd like to start by thanking our hosts who are not here. So the theoretical and biophysics group is more than just me, John, Dave, Kirby, and David. Um, there's a large number of grad students who actually work on the science, and Professor Shelton, you have sort of seen floating around, um, founder of the group back in the day. And what we try to do here, both from the software side and from the science side, and collaborating with experimentalists, is what Klaus has come to term computational microscopy. We want to understand how very small biomolecular systems work. And the tool for that is, of course, molecular dynamics. And just to reiterate, we have here two models for reading DNA sequences. This is the ribosome. This is how man does it. And the convenient thing is that we can use similar techniques to study both of these systems with some extensions to deal with the uh, solid state. That's a good point, except no one would know what you're talking about. I think I'd figure it out. Nanoscope. I'd like to remember that. Nanoscope. So our tool for this is uh, NAMDI. And what we really want to do with NAMDI is provide practical supercomputing. So we need a tool that can be used by people who are not computational experts. So we have a large number of users, most of them are a large fraction of them uh, NIH funded, many more around the world, and we need something that provides a similar user experience regardless of what the underlying hardware is. So if you're running on your laptop at a workshop, you can take those skills, transfer them directly to a departmental cluster, and when it <coughs> needs to grow large enough, go to uh, one of the supercomputing centers sponsored by the uh, National Science Foundation or the Department of Energy, and hopefully not have to understand too much about the inner workings of the program or uh, parallel performance characteristics. Is that the NAMDI team up there? Uh, no, that is one of the workshops. So those are users. Okay. So back in 2006, we were say, looking at basically writing our five-year proposal uh, to National Institutes of Health. And we said, okay, what? You know, there's going to be some sort of an accelerator option that we want to work on in the next couple of years. What requirements does that need to have? And we basically said, okay, it can't be something that's super specialized for MD. It has to be broadly available because we're not the only users of this. And it has to have a performance advantage over general purpose microprocessors that's going to exist from generation to generation. So with those three criteria, uh, we formed some collaborations and we did a few experiments. And we looked at FPGAs, we looked at the cell processor, uh, we worked with a company called ClearSpeed that had their own accelerated technology, and we looked at the uh, MD Grape technology, which is a special purpose processor from uh, a group in Japan. and. Then we also looked at uh, graphics cards, which had just developed the uh, GLSL shading language standard so that you could sort of morph that into doing CUDA-like operations. And they all had difficulties, but the most promising one we decided was GPUs because they were mass market, their performance was increasing regularly, and uh, they were readily available at an affordable price. So. 2006, I went to supercomputing, there was a multi-core workshop, and NVIDIA announced uh, that they were working on something called CUDA, which would be coming out really soon, and it sort of gelled the uh, solution for GPUs, because it's supported by a major hardware vendor, so this isn't something that's being grafted on by a third party that's going to have to play catch up whenever new hardware comes up. You didn't under have to understand graphics rendering performances, um, there were better programming paradigms than the uh, graphics-based GLSL programming had. You didn't have to deal with OpenGL at all, and you could actually have multiple clients accessing the same card. So had a lot of useful things. I came back, told John about it. He was sort of skeptical. Uh, then I ran into uh, David Kirk, who was the chief scientist for NVIDIA at the time, along with Wen Mei Wu, 
over at AC in the parking garage, and they said, hey, we're teaching a CUDA programming class. And I said, hey, can I sit on, in on it? And I told John he sat in, and by the end of the course, he was actually lecturing. So um, this was sort of our first sign that this had really, you know, had a yeah. Well, he's, he's, he's absolutely questions. right. I was a big naysayer. I said, ah, there's been all these other shading languages. This is no different, but I was wrong. It was very different. And it was, even though uh, what I had read on the web led me to believe there was really nothing new in CUDA, I realized after about three weeks that I was totally wrong and that I was going to very much get into this. And so by about halfway through the course, they basically... The week that we got our first GPU that could run CUDA, I then stayed in the lab and worked basically the whole weekend and, and figured out how to do this stuff. And uh, I was totally converted. So, so the collaboration with Wenmei and David Kirk was accidental? We had actually been working with yeah. Wenmei on FPGA. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the, Jim, Jim had been looking at FPGAs with Wenmei's guys for a while already. And John was, was skeptical a, of that, too. I was skeptical <laughs> of that, too. In that case, I was right, though. <laughs> so can I ask a, a quick um, question? How did how did NVIDIA even decide to even go down this path? I mean, you know, it, it, the cost, you know, certainly weren't going to get any sort of, uh, at least it didn't appear like maybe they were going to profit out of this. So why did they even start this path? The, well, if you look at the first generation of hardware that could run CUDA, uh, GeForce 8800, the only thing that was new and the GeForce 8800 that did not exist really in the prior generations of hardware uh, in terms of uh, hardware features, the shared memory. They already had the ability to execute arbitrary code. They already, already had branching. They already had all the things that we're familiar with. Uh, the main things that were different were they had this on-chip shared memory, and they had changed. I think there were a few spots in the hardware that were still done with uh, fixed point or 24-bit or precision floating point arithmetic in, in that previous series of GPUs. The GeForce 8800 was really the first hardware generation to use IEEE floating point all the way through the whole device. And so that was really probably the major thing that enabled them to say, all right, we're going to get serious about this. And they hired Ian Buck, who was one of the guys who originally developed Brook with Pat Hanrahan's group at Stanford. And Brook was one of the previous shading language, uh, sort of uh, computing-oriented language that sat on top of shading languages. So he came to NVIDIA, he started CUDA, and they basically did everything that they, they couldn't do when they did Brook and worked with their all their hardware people. And I guess then that started a chain reaction of making the hardware more and more compute-friendly but really, the GeForce 8800 was good enough for us to do everything we're doing now. And so I think uh, David Kirk told me that when they first contemplated making the GPUs compute capable, they were given a budget in terms of the hardware cost and the hardware chip area. They said, we'll give you uh, some, I think they said they could add like 5% cost or something. As, a, as an experiment, as taking a risk, you know. We'll give you 5% or, or whatever it is of the chip area to add whatever you want uh, to make it more compute friendly, but that's it. That's all you get, and if it doesn't work out, you're done, <laughs> or something. And uh, so that's, I guess they use that to put the shared memory on the GPU, because shared memory is a feature that is not used in any way in any of the pre-existing shading language stuff. So that was something they did add in the first generation of uh, G80 GPUs that was specifically for CUDA. And so I, I would say we should thank them for that because that definitely is what made it feasible to do a lot of the things we're doing now. I mean, it, like you saw those molecular orbital kernels and all that stuff, if it wasn't for the shared memory, there are a huge number of things you really just can't do efficiently. GPUs, that was a big and I think they, they did use the shared memory for writing the non-GLSL, basically. They had gone from removing special purpose hardware to having a more generically programmable GPU. Mm -hmm. When they're writing what was fixed function OpenGL operations, they could right. use the shared memory to implement some of those more efficiently. Yeah. Now, the other nice thing that NVIDIA did with CUDA was when it first came out, there was a danger 
but it was only going to be supported on the very highest level expensive yeah. quadro GPUs, and they sort of decided very early on in response to some, some academic and developer pressure that, you know, we're going to make this available on every, every GPU we sell. And then two years later, they can brag about how many could, you know, million CUDA-capable devices they've sold and are out in the wild. And, you know, any high school student who wants to learn parallel programming can go buy a $200 graphics card with their parents' money and move on. So, so that's how we got where we were today. And, of course, as popular as uh, NAMD is, VMD is even more popular because it's used not only by the users of NAMD, it's used by the users of NAMD's competitors, as well as people in completely different fields that still have to deal with atomic level structures. So VMD has you know, a large number of CUDA accelerated features at this point, although they're sort of selected for, yes? I just wanted to add that I, um, I run some uh, continual um, elastic calculations where I essentially, I mean, it's, it's a custom written code, like linear elasticity models, and the best way to visualize basically long fibers is for me to write them as C alpha. C yeah. alpha is then just to use all the VMD <laughs> capability. Yeah, VMD I mean, gets abused. I, actually, it's funny. I have people occasionally <laughs> tell me, you know, I, I wish VMD was more strict about chemistry, and then I have other people tell me, it's great that VMD doesn't care what I name those atoms, because they're not even atoms. I, I have people telling me, oh, can I use VMD to look at galaxies? And I said, nah, that's probably not a good idea. But, you know, th they definitely, when it came to things like coarse graining and stuff like this, where we're diverging from traditional all-atom simulations, making VMD a little more flexible and accepting of alternative ideas of atom radii and things like that, you know, makes it possible to do those things. You can it supports just reading the PDB. Yeah, exactly. So it yeah. works for okay. So on the NAMI side, most of the research that's been done is on parallelization. And this goes back to uh, basically the late 90s when NAMI 2 came out. And we used a uh, programming system called Charm++. Charm++. Which has nothing to do with charm, right? Which has right. absolutely it's nothing to do with it's charm. It's just a con an added point of confusion because people always hold it. Okay. <laughs> so there, there, there are actually two points. So the first half of the way NAMD works internally is we do what's called a spatial decomposition. So you have a large set of atoms and you break that up into spatial domains, which we call patches. They're sort of these cubes or rectangles that fill space. And if you make those slightly larger than the cutoff distance for your short-range interaction, you can guarantee that if any atom that is in this patch on the left does not interact with any atom that is on this patch on the right. So all of your interactions for this patch are sort of the one-away neighboring patches. In NAMD1, we treated um, basically each of these domains as its own little processor, and it would import data from its neighbors, calculate, and return things back. That had a load balancing issue, and we found we could do better if we said, okay, we'll treat the data that's in these cubes as one operation, and that's where the data lives. And then the interaction between any neighboring pair of cubes will represent as a separate class of objects that we call compute objects that actually calculate those forces. So how much... Uh of the communication between the different uh, spatially decomposed blocks.